some video games, no matter how good they are, have that one thing that holds it up from being what we would otherwise consider to be a perfect playing experience. They are more often than not sequels that we often measure against the original. Despite how good they do to improve on the original, there's just something that is just shy of perfection. Up next are three examples of such games. Please feel free to agree with me or fight me. Please also tell me in detail why you think I'm right or wrong, looking for constructive debates. How does a game that improved on the original in gameplay, story, and fun departments make it hard to go back to Breath of the Wild and even set the internet on fire with its, um creative ambitions not feel quite as satisfied as the first, even ranking just one point lower on Metacritic? Well, the answer, I think, is freshness. I can see you in the comment section saying, Josh, you know, okay, Breath of the Wild came first. Okay, great job. There's your trump card. Remember when Stranger Things debuted in 2016 and we were all like, wow, that came out of nowhere. Well, that for me was Breath of the Wild. The cartoon and realistic style had been done before Skyward Sword, but there was no one really prepared for how big and ambitious this project was going to be. Yeah, sure, the story kind of sucked a little bit. I mean, don't tell me this was Ganon. This is a flying pig with Ganon's name attached. The side quests were also... Uh, there, I guess, but it made up for it with its customization, non-linear progression, and breaking completely away, well, mostly away from the original Zelda formula. Tears of the Kingdom measured up against Breath of the Wild. Yes, we had a way better story. I actually knew who I was fighting against. We had way better traversal. My gosh, was it easier to get around Hyrule. And there was way more area to explore. They didn't just copy and paste Breath of the Wild's map. They actually added the sky as advertised, but then they also added the underground and it didn't even get leaked. I mean, man, was I on board for that. What a surprise that was. Of my 120 hour playthrough of this game, 90 hours was spent spelunking. Uh, spelunking? Spelunking. Yeah, you know, cave diving. Yet for all of that, you could clearly see that the game's focus was to perfect on the original rather than do something new. And that's not a bad thing at all. I loved the heck out of this game, but I didn't feel as wowed as I did when I finished Breath of the Wild. Satisfied? Absolutely. I was absolutely satisfied with my time with Tears of the Kingdom, but going forward, I think we could use a smaller game where Link talks or is giving a, some sort of reason for his being mute because everyone talking around him and him not talking kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. Let me know what your take on this is in the comment section below. I honestly also do not think we need a sequel to Tears of the Kingdom. I think what's here is here and any more perfections on this I think kind of would have diminishing returns. Instead, I really think Zelda needs to go in a brand new direction. Big action set pieces? Check. New combat and travel options? Check. Playing as Venom for that short but epic few minutes at the end? Absolutely check. But it has one glaring problem from it measuring up against the first one, and that is story. To clarify parts of the story, they absolutely nailed Miles and Mr. Negative on the head perfectly. Pairing up Miles with the guy who killed his father was absolute perfect drama, but Peter received a major downgrade. He went from quippy to quirky, and he would not stop apologizing. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, Lonnie. I really do want to help you. Sorry we're late. I'm sorry. Sorry I wasn't here to help. Sorry. Miles, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Move. The story also went from a romance with Peter and MJ to a bromance with Peter and Harry. And Harry and Pete are obviously good friends, but the shift in focus killed the momentum of the first game's Peter and MJ relationship. Not to mention MJ taking out trained soldiers without a second thought kind of took a lot of people out of it. I don't think this would have happened if Spider Gwen were doing all this because she actually has superpowers. Who wrote the story again? Oh. Regardless, what worked for the first game works here, and there are even more options. Even for gamers with 5-10 to 10 hours a week, can very easily break this down into bite-sized chunks and 100% it in not that much time. I just wish the story could have been either as good or better than the first, but regardless, it still remains a top 5 Spider-Man game of all time. Not many Spider-Man games live up to this one. 
Jedi Survivor did almost everything right. Unlike Tears of the Kingdom and Spider-Man 2, Jedi Survivor felt truly fresh. While it had familiar faces and gameplay elements, it moved to new areas of the galaxy and transitioned from the old villains to the new villains. The game allowed also for varied combat styles and difficulty had way more options than the first game. So their focus was absolutely in the right direction. Unfortunately, I think where they went wrong is the game needed a bit more polish before release. The release date was April 28th, 2023, right before May 4th, 2023. Unfortunately, they chose releasing an unfinished game before National Star Wars Day instead of letting it cook a little bit more. In this situation, it definitely did pay to be a dad gamer like me, finishing games in the backlog like Tears of the Kingdom and Spider-Man 2, and seeing the reviews and hoping for a patch before I started. Luckily, the patches did fix a lot, but it didn't fix everything. For some, these games are a bit game-breaking, BD1 not giving the option to scan or fiddle with the cables for traversal. For others, BD1's head being invisible with two floating antennae is kind of funny, but it's also kind of immersion breaking. Thanks to the internet, devs are more motivated to release games and patch later, and what's nice about being a dad gamer is not all of these games are being played day one, and you can play when the game has been fixed, with the asterisk being we shouldn't have to do that, really. We should be playing complete games like we did in previous generations. Bugs aside, Jedi Survivor does more than live up to the original. I think it exceeds it. The character progression, the not losing previous game abilities, and actually just having new abilities, the new play styles, they all contribute to not making a game that aims to perfect the original, but really to be unique and fresh. If they had foregone the May the 4th be with you day and added more polish, I really do think that it could be a perfect game. Not perfect in the sense of error free or anything, but I do think it could have reached the heights of something like Red Dead Redemption, or some of the higher reviewed games out there. So am I right or am I completely nuts? I'm open to being challenged. Please let me know in the comments below what your take on these are. All these games together took me two to three months each, playing about five to 10 hours a week. If you like the game but have little time like I do, this video right here in the middle of the screen is going to help you get the most out of your sessions, especially if you are in your 30s or older. I'll catch you on the next one.